Hello and welcome to NAPA Live. I'm your host, Zach Hules. As always, we have a great program lined up for you today. After some brief association updates, you'll hear from today's featured speaker. Immediately following that, there will be an interactive breakout Q&A with the speaker himself, so please have your questions ready. But before all that, we are going to move over to our volunteer out from NAFA, Tennessee, with the Pledge of Allegiance, John D. Richardson. John? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, John. And now we're going to turn things over to NAFA CEO Kevin Mayu for some NAFA announcements. Hello, NAFA Nation, and welcome to our July 2022 edition of NAFA Live. We're glad that you're here. I want to talk to you about our next big conference coming up, and that is APEX, which is the new sales summit for the American Advisor. It's shaping up to be an absolutely incredible event next month at the beautiful Arizona Biltmore in Phoenix. I'm here to announce today that we've added two great pre-conference workshops. One is focused on women advisors and the critical role that they play within our industry. And another is based upon the Hispanic advisor, which addresses specific challenges and opportunities, again, with a view of getting Hispanic advisors and women advisors more involved in advocacy, helping to provide some basic training so that we can amplify our collective voice in state capitals and in Washington, DC, and help policymakers understand the critical impacts the decisions that they're making have on all Americans across this great country. APEX is August 17th through 18th, and it's gonna feature some top speakers, including Cody Askins, Caleb Gilliams, Dr. Rosen, and industry speakers from Nationwide, Aetna, P2P, and many more. We're also gonna have some industry legends with us, including Joe Jordan, Tom Hegna, and Jim Silvernagel, and others that'll be there to meet with you and talk shop and help you do even better in your practice. Aside from the great talent and the great opportunity to network with so many top advisors from across this country, the event again is being held at the beautiful five-star Arizona Biltmore, which has top restaurants, bars, and a spa. It's gonna be an absolutely incredible experience for everyone who decides to attend. If you wanna learn more, please look up the information on our website at apex.nafa.org. And remember, we've got special discounts available for NAFA volunteers and Lilly graduates. So if you're interested in signing up, you can either do that during our live chat that's going on during NAFA Live, or you can call our member experience team at 877-866-2432. One more thing I wanna note is that our rate at the Biltmore is an exceptional rate. It's about a third of the rack rate that they've got posted and our special registration rate expires at the end of next week. So time is of the essence to sign up, secure that great rate, and join us for an absolutely incredible conference coming up in August in Phoenix, Arizona. Aside from looking forward to APEX, I also want to mention that August is our home for in-district meetings. It's a great opportunity for NAFA members to meet with their elected members of Congress back in their home districts, and again, talk about key issues that are impacting your clients and their communities, and then help policymakers make good decisions on behalf of the American public. We'd like to have everyone involved in these district meetings, and we'd love to have your help, especially if you know any new advisors or new members to NAFA. We'd love to get them involved in our advocacy efforts at the local level. It's real simple. Contact your chapter grassroots chair and find out how to best get involved in the in-district meetings that will be taking place in August back in your hometown. We'd really like to make sure our congressional members hear from NAFA members and help make good public policy decisions on behalf of everyday Americans. And now we're gonna move on to our speaker. We owe a great debt of gratitude to our speaker. And not only do we honor him for his service to our country, but we also thank him for the tremendous service he has given NAFA at so many different levels, both serving as a leader in Tampa with the state of Florida and on the NAFA National Board of Trustees. Steve Saladino has been a great advocate for NAFA at every level and has helped grow our membership across the board and also our special relationship with principal. So thank you, Steve, for all that you have done for NAFA. We absolutely respect you, we honor you, and we're glad to hear your words of encouragement today. Please welcome Steve Saladino. 
Well, thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate that kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, NAFA, NAFA family. It's so good to be with each and every one of you. I am really excited today to share uh, my life and, and my story with each and every one of you today. Uh, this is this has been a long time coming, so I'm, I want you to know I'm ex excited, but I'm extremely honored, and I consider this a privilege to present to this group of amazing financial professionals. So today we're going to be talking about opening more doors and closing more sales. And I know for most people, that's something that gets uh, your attention. It gets a lot of people to attend uh, anytime that you can get in front of more qualified prospects, make more sales, help more people. So, But before we do that, I would just like to ask a few things if I can. Um, what I would like to do is ask you to just you know, look for opportunities to relate my story um, if you're somebody that's brand new in the business, I would ask you to just kind of look at some of the lessons that have been learned by me and probably people you've heard of or been working with already. If you're experienced, you've been in the business for a long time, I would just ask for you to look for opportunities to refresh, uh, renew, and maybe look for opportunities to relate to something that maybe used to work and maybe you forgot about it. It worked so good you quit doing it. So um, that's what I asked for today. Before we can get to opening more doors and closing more sales, because I think we'll all admit it just it's not that easy. Uh, I'd ask that you go on a bit of a journey with me. And this journey is going to go way back. I mean, way back. So I'd also ask for your patience. I'd ask you to indulge me as I go through, because in order for you to understand how my NAFA membership uh, has gotten me or helped me get to where I am today, uh, it is, you know, for you to be able to understand how I've been able to open more doors, close more sales, or have any you know, uh, a sense of success, which I'm going to show you what that means to me uh, in my NAFA membership, you need to know the journey and the path that I took uh, and some of the best practices, some of the lessons and things like that. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'll start off with a question is, will you be one of the few? And I ask this because, you know, we all know how difficult this business is. We all understand that, you know, a lot of people don't make it. Um, in fact, if you, if you think about or if you know about what LIMRA says, and that's the Life Insurance Market Research Association, and depending on when you look at that research, I think the most recent one I looked at was in 2018. It said for everybody that starts a career in financial services today, at the end of the fourth year, there will be about 16 of those financial professionals left. So you got to ask yourself, wow, you know, why, why would I want to get in business or get into a business with those kind of odds? Well, you know, it's definitely not the faint of heart. Uh, many of us um, like that, though. We like that kind of a challenge. And as you see in my story, that's part of, you know, what I've gone through is challenges. But odds like that, you know, I don't know about you, but it seems like my life has always, you know, been at odds. It's never been this smooth, straight kind of a uh, road that's been smooth to go on. It's been a lot of bumps and a lot of hills and a lot of twists and turns. So, so let's start. So, you know, I want you to know that I'm not supposed to be here. And that's me way back when in 1967. I told you it was going to go way back, but it's going to be done in about 45 or 50 minutes here. But, you know, I was uh, born a premature baby. I weighed five pounds, two ounces and was sick from day one, you know, had a lot of medical issues and really was not expected to live very long and had a lot of medical issues growing up. So uh, as you could see there, I was a run. I was a preemie. And uh, for those of you that know me and can see me on the screen, I'm still pretty much a little bit of a run. So run of the family, still a little guy, but, uh, um, you know, it started off really with the odds against me. And that's really where my story goes. You know, the odds have always been a stacked against me, uh, in my opinion. And you see this picture here. This is one of my elementary school pictures. Um, and it should be, you know, a face for radio. So you're wondering how I talked somebody in at NAFA National into letting me get on this Zoom call with America's finest here across the country. Um, I've learned to smile a little bit better since then, but, you know, I was always shy. And for those that really know me well, they know that I really still do struggle with networking and getting in groups of people. Uh, although I enjoy presenting, when it comes to those networking opportunities or trying to find my way into groups of people, I still struggle with that. So um, networking is not for me. I was pretty insecure. I was a middle child not quite old enough to do what my older brother did and too, too grown up and too old to be acting like a baby like my little brother. So I was just right there in the middle. And I struggled. I struggled a lot in life. I struggled in school to find my place. Um, when I say struggled in school, you know, I, I, I want to make sure you understand the depth of what my struggles were. And I would say today that, you know, as you look back, as I look back, and I brought you some proof here, this is, this is just proof. You know, this is one, this is where I got a notice of being suspended for possession of firecracker in school. 
you know, yes, yes, I know that you're not supposed to do that. My parents taught me better. I know right from wrong. I had loving parents, but you know what? Um, look at the report card. Um, yeah, I'm pretty proud of it. I got some A's. I want you to know that the A's were in physical education, agriculture, you know, anything that I could perform in, I got good grades. Anything that you asked me to put a pen and paper to, I struggled or failed. Um, I struggled through my entire high school. I went to, I went to summer school each and every year of my high school years. So I didn't have the greatest of summer and really kind of messed up the family plans as well. So not really proud of that, but if I look back now, and if you talk to most people, I probably, uh, I, I did have undiagnosed AD&D, ADD, and um, a lot of people know me now to know, and maybe as you're hearing me speak now, I'm a little nervous and speaking fast, you say, well, maybe he still has that. It was undiagnosed back then, um, but actually they diagnosed it as a behavior issue. I talked a lot in school. I created a lot of interference. I tried to get a lot of attention. Um, and so I struggled. I struggled in school. I had a lot of discipline issues. And because of the comprehension issues, the way, the way we were being taught, uh, I struggled retaining information. And so when it came to test taking and things, I, got, I, I failed the test. I got so far behind because I was having a hard time understanding that my grades suffered because of that. And then again, it was summer school. And honestly, I just believed that a lot of the teachers really liked me and they saw me trying when I was in school, I skipped school a lot, I'll admit it, um, that, that I passed and I did the minimal acceptable standards. Um, I'm not proud to tell you back then that I graduated high school and the highest level of math, this is where the vulnerability of our business and of my presentation is going to start. The highest level of math that I took in school in all 12 of my years of school was business math. Uh, I never took calculus, geometry, algebra, uh, trigonometry, any of those fancy classes that uh, I couldn't help my kids with when, when I had children of my own. So I was really, you know, struggling with what do I do next? Um, so I graduated school barely. Um, and, it, and really, I want you to know, and as part of the presentation where you're going to start to see my life take a turn, is where people were involved in seeing something in me that I didn't see in myself. It involved people giving me a hand up, not a handout. It really was people being there for me. So I really got my first break in 1985. Um, a lady had mentioned, a very close family member had mentioned that, you know, she felt like I had the gift of gab. And she honestly had said, uh, just like one of my elementary school teachers, and I saw the notes uh, that my mom kept, that I would either get into the insurance business or become a preacher. And I think both of them are noble professions. And that's, it's just kind of ironic that I chose one of the two. And that's my, been my path for the past almost 32 years now, but she saw that gift of gab in me and she got me an interview with the district manager for life and casualty insurance company, uh, which was later on purchased by American general. This was a debit life insurance company. So for those of you that started your insurance career in the debit business, that's how I got in and that's how I cut my teeth. And I absolutely fell in love with this. I think first and foremost, because I was taught a track book and track to run on and it wasn't too comprehensive and it had a lot of pictures and I'm a very visual person. And so I was able to actually present to people. And uh, I, I'm proud to tell you that I became the leading rookie agent in 11 months, my first 11 months there. So I could not be happier in my performance. I picked up something I absolutely loved. I could make a difference. I was making a lot of money. I was smart enough to see that if you could sell more and service less, you could make more money. So I was able to get a lot of my clients, um, out of me picking up their premiums door to door uh, or monthly to automatic bank draft for quarterly and less frequent type of payment options, that gave me more opportunities to visit with families, work my book of business, get referrals and things like that. So very proud of that. Now, that was my first break and it changed my life. Somebody helping me, somebody seeing something in me. But I'll tell you, my odds, my odds kept coming back. Um, my luck is just not the greatest. Uh, I, I've said to people before that if, if my ship ever comes in, I'll probably be at the airport. So in that 11 months, what I need to tell you is back then, and I don't know if it's the same now, but in the state of Florida, you were given a temporary insurance license. So I was given a temporary life insurance license in order to conduct business. I could sell without even having a license, um, provided that I was just getting the training and the development and the mentoring by the staff and the managers and the company, and they taught you the products and services, don't get me wrong, and they gave us a track to run on, a sales process, 
fact finding needs analysis, all the right things, but you actually could solicit the business and get a commission with a temporary license. Now, here's where things start to go bad. And for those of you that know, you have to take a test and um, you have to pass the test to get a, a legal license, to have a full-time license. Um, and in this 11 months, um, I was presented with an opportunity to take the test and I failed it. And what you may or may not know is, is that they give you three times to pass that test before they just kind of look at you and tell you, hey, you either need to go look for some other form or line of work to do, or you need to come back to us in, I think it was a year to retest again. Well, my odds just ran out and I took the test three times in my 11 months and uh, my temporary license expired the next month and I was out of business. I, you know, the, the district manager came to me and honestly, as I'm telling you today with tears in his eyes telling me, I, I've, I've never gone from hiring somebody with, a, with a, an exception because he was only 18 and the company standard was 19 to having to fire a leading rookie representative. I just, you, Saladino, you've given me all this in, in 11 or 12 months and I've just never had to do it. So reluctantly and, and disappointingly, he had to terminate me. So that I got terminated from the life insurance business in 1985 with just 11 months in the business. So I go thinking through my choices. And so, you know, what, what does any, you know, what does, what does anybody do that is faced with those kind of challenges, those kind of odds, that kind of disappointment, those kind of struggles, that kind of background and experience? Well, I did what anybody else would do. I, uh, I ran away to the army. And so, um, you know, and this, this wasn't a surprise. It really wasn't part of my plan. Um, honestly, I'd never considered it up until this point. And I'm being honest with you when I tell you I ran away, uh, just as much as I skipped school when the tests were coming or I was frustrated or overwhelmed, I ran away to the Army. Um, I went down to the recruiter's office. I shared with them that every male in our family was, uh, had served our country and they were veterans and that you know I had a great deal of respect for our armed forces and I'm very patriotic. I love the military you know, aspects. Um, my father, for those of you uh, who don't know, my father's a Marine. And so I count that 18 years growing up with my father's 18 years of service in the, in the Marine Corps. Um, I, I don't take it lightly, but that, that set the stage for making the decision to run away or, con or contemplating uh, a career in the military, one that was a little bit easier to come by. So I'm sitting in the recruiter's office and the recruiter's office is much like our business and that they were doing fact finding. They're talking to a 19 year old just turning 19 year old gentleman uh, who really doesn't know where he wants to go or what he wants to do. They gave me a test and uh, that's, that's where the sweating started. And that's where I started to get concerned because I told them I'm not a very good test taker. And ironically speaking, the test scores came back in where they offered me some careers and showed me some career books and some videos for some careers that I never would have, I never would have thought of. And I would have never would have contemplating. And I think the funny thing is, is that one of the careers was finance and accounting. Now, I don't know how you go from barely graduating high school and the highest level of math is business math to finance and accounting. And um, that, that honestly didn't strike a chord with me. Um, I was more of that daredevil jump off the roof, you know, jumping my motorcycle, you know, doing the crazy things. So I was more of looking at some of the hazardous duty jobs than I was finance and accounting. But if I'm being honest with this group, which you know, that's all I know to be, um, I saw a couple of things that piqued my interest. Number one, I saw a picture of people walking around in what they call class B uniforms, which was really short sleeve military dress attire without a jacket on. And uh, it appeared as though they were walking around in an office complex with desks they were collaborating with each other. There was phones. There was a lot of filing cabinets. There was a lot of metal, a lot of metal desk and filing cabinets back then. But it reminded me of my father's career. Uh, my dad worked for Delta Airlines. And so it reminded me of my father's career. And I thought, that's a career. It, it just, it hit me. It's a career. Uh, I thought of the career that my dad was proud of, his retirement. I thought about the 95. I thought about building benefits and money and making good living and doing something respectable. But then if I'm being, you know, totally honest, there was a lot of ladies in the picture and I was 19. And so that was, that did it for me. So I told the gentleman, I told the recruiter, I'd like to learn more about it. So I'm signing my paperwork to go into the army. I'm going to be uncle, part of uncle Sam. I'm going to be uncle Sam's property. And I am on delayed entry for less than 30 days. And before 
I signed the final paperwork. The recruiter says, you know, we've got an opportunity for you to join an elite group of individuals. In fact, you'll be only one of 83 that would be a part of this group. And I said, tell me more. He goes, you could be a part of the 82nd Airborne Division, and you could be a paratrooper, and you would be part of a group that only has 83 people that support and is part of this elite division, one of America's finest and well-known divisions, uh, and support 16,000 soldiers. You're going to have really good career advancement opportunities and promotions. You're going to get paid $110 extra per month for hazardous duty. I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What's the $110 a month for? And they said, it's called hazardous duty pay. It's proficiency pay. It's, you'd be a paratrooper. You would be airborne. And, they're gonna, I, and I'm thinking to myself, well, you can buy a lot of beer for $110 a month. I said, sign me up. So that's it. I became part of Uncle Sam. The problem is, is that after four years, and this picture indicates really just a performance that I'm proud of, I became the 82nd Airborne, my division's trooper of the year. Um, it became part of the 82nd Finance Support Unit's Division Trooper of the Year. Uh, and this is some of the promotions that they do. They give you a media spot. You get a trophy. You get an award. You get some savings bonds. They get a write-up in the newspaper. A lot of stuff goes home. And this is the, the media spot. So I'm very, very proud of this. Um, I, I had a really good, good time because I was able to perform. I was able to perform at the highest level. And then I was able to work with other people. Uh, I was promoted as a non-commissioned officer to the sergeant level. I was able to lead other people and follow a path and show them how to perform like me and run a track. I had a path to run on and one that I could show others how to follow. So I was very, 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 very pleased. Little side note here, you see the equipment I'm wearing. That is a full combat jump, all except for it's the daytime. We did nighttime jumps almost all the time to prepare for combat. That is me at a scrapping weight of 136 pounds. And I gained weight in the military. I went from 128 to 136. And so I, I weighed eight pounds more than when I went in and all that equipment I weighed. So for those of you out there, I want you to know I'm five, four and a half. I still am. Dropped back down to 128. I'm blessed for that. Um, but I wore the same amount of equipment, the same weight of equipment as those of you in the audience and those fellow paratroopers that I served with and jumped with that were five, nine, six, one, six, two that weighed you know, 180, 230, 240, um, we weighed the same amount of equipment and I, and I, I kept up with all the, all the others, did my job and performed very, very well. But you know what, here we go again. The odds come crumbling down. They come haunting me again. Uh, for those of you that know, back in 1990, uh, the defense budget was cut. Um, they were doing a reduction in force. We call it a RIF. Uh, they did away with all the reenlistment options like going to schools. I was slated to go to drill sergeant school. Um, jump master school was kind of put on hold. Um, they were not giving any bonuses. They basically said, Steve, you can either stay at Fort Bragg for another four years. Uh, that recruiter lied and did not get to travel the world. And I'm thankful for part of that. Um, or you can just get out. And so, you know, I really chose, you know, I, I really want to re-explore my options. And so, you know, one of the things I'll tell you is, is that my second break came in 1990. And I really thought about getting back into the insurance business because I fell in love with it in just a short amount of time. I found, you know, what, how great it was to be a fabric of society and community and of people's lives. Those family record books, those books of businesses allowed me to meet everybody in the family, the neighbors, coworkers, you know, people in front and back and on both sides of their houses. And I really, really enjoyed becoming a part of their lives, becoming their friend and making a difference in their lives. Much like serving in the military, it was ongoing service, but I really missed this opportunity. And if I'm being honest, you know, I was working 60 or 80 hours a week, depending on what week it was, between my day job and my nighttime airborne operations. And when I did the math, I still don't know how they did away with this, and it's not for the free healthcare and food. Um, I was being paid less than minimum wage. Uh, I felt like I was worth more. I felt like I could do more with my life. Not that I'm not, wasn't, and not still very proud of my military service. I'm still very patriotic, and most of you know that, but I wanted to explore my options. So uh, I started looking into getting back into the business. I had 30 days terminal leave, which is like vacation. And so for 30 days, I started exploring options. My dad, as I mentioned to you, worked for Delta Airlines, and coincidentally, uh, one of the flight attendants' father worked for Metropolitan Life, and he was kind enough. Again, here's my second break of somebody extending an, a hand, uh, making an introduction, 
And it's part of networking and part of the collaboration, me utilizing my centers of influences, not being afraid to ask for help, and got an interview with Metropolitan Life. Uh, for those of you on the line that know Ed Barber here in Tampa uh, with Metropolitan Life, he was an amazing man. Big Ed was a good man, a good human, a, an amazing leader. But most importantly, Ed, you know, was not, you know, was not afraid to, to help you, uh, was not afraid to get in your face, uh, loved you, cared about you. And uh, some of the lessons I learned were that, you know, he led by example. Ed, uh, Ed got me the job at Metropolitan Life. Um, he helped me get that job. And I'll tell you that one of the things, I'm going to back up here a second, one of the things that was important was, and you've heard this said before, and it's not a lie, it's true, it was true for me, is that I signed two times the day I started with Metropolitan Life. And Ed said, before you, before you sign, I want you to think about this, that I'm hiring you to retire. Back then, they would talk about retiring in a career, and it was not something that scared people. I know that different generations get scared today, but I was intrigued, and I was attracted by the fact that I could do as much as I wanted to do, much like I thought the military, being all I could be in the Army, in a career that would allow me to change and evolve and not necessarily have to change companies or be able to change what I was doing within the business and the industry uh, and make a career out of it. So that was important to me. So when I signed my agent's contract, at the, next, the next signature I made, and I promise you, Scout's honor, Scout's truth is my application to the National Association of Life Underwriters, which for you newer folks is what we were previously named before we became NAPA. And Ed, Ed really encouraged me to join. He shared with me the fact that he would be there with me. He told me that if I was serious about a career, that I needed to be serious about the industry that I was going to be joining uh, and that I needed to give back. I needed to learn from other people outside of Metropolitan Life um, and that I needed to be professionally developed and they, that there was a lot of schools and tools and resources and professional development that I could learn outside of Metropolitan Life that would help me hone my skills. And he believed in iron sharpening iron. So, you know, Ed, Ed really was part of the reason why I got into NAFA. Um, I got with MetLife back at the end of 1990 and joined you know, right away, I became active in 91. Uh, and when I mean active, I mean active like I started on a membership committee back in 1991. Um, uh, the company had some issues that they went through. And so there was a little bit of lapse in, in my, my membership there for a couple of months, it looks like, but I'm getting credit from 1991 rather than 1990. But nonetheless, I've been an active, engaged member and a volunteer member leader since 1991. And I owe it all to Ed. I owe it all to the company and the career and the, the leadership and the lead by example. Um, I, I'm gonna share with you some of the examples that I've learned just in these couple of examples that I've shared with you and then through Ed to Metropolitan Life and my association with NALU or NAFA now is, is that as you can see, none of this was me alone. I am blessed that I've been given help by other people, other people who've paid you know, the price themselves they, you know, they, they made mistakes, they, they got their nose bloodied already, and they didn't want to see me have to do it. And so they really reached out and wanted to help me. Most of them were leading my example, and they were paying it forward. They were giving me something that, you know, I couldn't get, or I was accelerating, I was being accelerated in my knowledge and my learning. And, and I live by this today. And that's, that's where, you know, I spend a lot of my time today, I'm blessed to be able to help a lot of other people because a lot of help, a lot of people help me get to where I am. And I use the word blessed because I believe, you know, without getting religious that, that, you know, higher powers put me in front of a lot of people that has enabled me to help them and make an impact in their life. Just like the same thing happened to me. Ed taught me and, and shared with me the importance of joining professional associations. He believed in NALU. I believe in NAFA today. I want to share with you how and why that's made a significant impact in my life and in my profession, and that the lives of others that I've been able to work with uh, individually and in group situations. I believe, and that's not just from my father and through my military experience, but I believe good leaders lead by example. Um, I, I just believe that, you know, to, to be able to show people how to do it, and especially for, and you'll see in my story here, people that don't necessarily learn by you telling them, I believe leading by example is you showing, not showing people, but you showing people and not just telling them, showing them how it's done, because if they learn the way I do, and if they're visual or you need to show them how to do it, that might be better to learn. And I'll tell you, once you show me something, uh, I don't forget it. I've got a really good memory. My comprehension is uh, obviously improved a little. So um, 
but but I'm going to share you know share with you some of those challenges that I had because of that. And then I try to stress, and I learned today that it's not a job; it's a career. Um, it's something that I'm building, something I can be proud of, and something most importantly that I am growing to to monetize it someday. It's it's an integral part of my family, my legacy, but most importantly, my retirement income plan. And so, growing it and building it in order to prepare succession from catastrophe to succession is important because I'm going to monetize this. And when, it, when you think like that, I, I really believe, and I have been able to take better care of it because I'm taking ownership. So these are just some of the things that I, that I wanted to share with you. Now, you know, one of the things that I want to share with you is that, you know, at Metropolitan, I had to take a lot of, you know, tests, just like we all have. And since then, and I passed all my exams. I'm going to tell you, I went to work with Metropolitan that first 30 days. I got my license. I passed my first exam. And Lord knows I've taken tests and we've taken credentialing and professional development and CE tests ever since I started this business. And you know what? I am I'm an avid learner. I'm a reader and I'm a learner now. Um, I believe in credentialing and professional development. And it's amazing how much it has shifted from me struggling and avoiding it and skipping school, whatever it might be, to really just involving myself and volunteering and learning more. Um, and we're, we're blessed to work in an industry that allows us to learn something each and every day. But how do, my, how do the odds come back? You know, well, we all know that this is not easy. You know, you start off the business, and if you started like I did, and Ed said, listen, it's all about getting in front of qualified people. And we're going to start with the Limmer Project 100. I don't know, and, and people are probably looking at the screen, and I hope you're grinning or maybe snickering a little bit. All the managers do this. They want you to start with your family and friends. And it's, and it's not because the company wants you to sell your family and friends. It's that it's easier. And if you understand, as I mentioned in the last slide about it being a career and taking ownership and caring about what you're doing and wanting to make an impact, wouldn't you want to make an impact with those that you know and love the most? And I think people look at that wrong and think about it. Well, it's low hanging fruit. And, you know, well, maybe it is. Well, let me tell you what happened with me. I went back to Ed two additional times to get more books. Each book holds 100 names. And so I had close to 300 names, filled out almost three books because I'm born and raised in the Tampa Bay area where Ed Barber and Metropolitan Life hired me. And Ed was impressed. The entire staff and management team was impressed. They were pretty excited. Um, they really saw really big things happen to me. So between doing some of these things, they were all the right things to do to get started. However, you know your past is your past. So what happened? Although I'm exceeding the goals and doing what I'm asked to be doing and, and aligning myself in all the proper areas with the proper people and organizations to be successful, it still boils down to me and the effort. But my past came back to haunt me. And what do I mean by that? Well, this is what people remembered when I started calling on my natural market. Yeah, that's me on the right. I'm actually in a military dorm or barracks, they call them back then. They're dorms now. It looks like college campuses now. It's really nice apartments and condos. We're drinking in the dorm, you know, so when you're not working, the only other form of entertainment was drinking. And um, if I'm being honest with you, which I always have been, I was really good at it, or I thought I was. It's something I did a lot for entertainment, and, uh, but this is something that came back to bite me. I had a few family members do some business with me, maybe six or eight of that almost 300 book. Um, but I had a lot of comments like, you know, Stevie, I love you, but I've got CDs older than you. Or, you know, Steve, I, I appreciate what you're telling me, and I wish you the best of luck, but I, want, I wish you luck, but I want you to come back and see me after you've been doing this for a while. Let's talk in a year. And, and then others just didn't say anything, or maybe they just decided they had somebody else, or they just didn't come up with a good enough or a nice enough way to tell me that they just didn't want to do business with me. But I think ultimately, this is what they're remembering. You know, this is a 19-year-old a kid that is uh, now 22 that was drinking in the military from 1922. Um, just still a young guy, you know, he was a wild child. And, and I'm thinking this is what people are remembering. So it's unfortunate that, you know, that this happened, but it was actually one of the best things that happened because my family didn't get my business started and I didn't fail with family relying on me to service them and then me not be there to service them. A few family members entrusted me. I think that some of them will still do anything for me today, but I, I appreciate the fact that I had family that was honest with me. So it helped me and it forced me to think outside the box. And so that's where my third break came in. And this is where we're going to go. And I know it seems like a long 20, 25 minute route to the presentation at hand, but the third break came from centers of influences. 
One of the names on that Project 200, 300 that I did was Russell Adams. And in Land O'Lakes, Florida, he's a very well-known realtor, a family member friend. And Russell always spent time with me. I dropped by there from time to time. He gave me you know, wise counsel, shared with me insight to being a business owner from a young man himself to you know, 30, 40, 50 years in business. But one of the things he said one day that struck me is he showed me this list and it was a list of people that have bought or sold homes in the last 30 days. And he, he subscribed to that list somehow or another, but it was sitting on his desk with a big binder or paper clip on it. And he said, Steve, this is a list of people that have bought or sold homes in our county or the tri-county area, I think it was, in the last 30 days. And I, I subscribed to it and I look at it just to see if anybody has bought or sold a home that we presented those opportunities to, because I want to make sure that my, our realtors weren't cut out of their fair compensa the compensation. And I, he said, is this something you could use? And I said, Russell, it absolutely is. One of the markets that I've heard a lot about is the mortgage market. And so this became my first center of influence, but more importantly, became my first target market, which was the center of influence, which was the target market of mortgage protection in case of death or disability. Now, this turned into as my kids started to get older in the first three to five years, which you all know is, is tough you know, an assembly line of putting together a thousand letters, folding and stuffing and licking and putting labels on thousand, a thousand letters per month, paying the postage, doing the return envelopes and sending them out and waiting for responses. Back then we used to get anywhere from one, two, 3% returns. And this became my first target market in that three-legged stool that we've already heard about. The natural market referrals wasn't working. So I built something with a target market. And then I started to look at my affinities and affiliations and the military, Delta Airlines, my mom being in the school system, those started to prove that third leg and other types of target market opportunities. So this is really where I went. And this was really the formation, this break. Again, another person helping me out, hand, not a handout, but a hand up. Maybe it was a handout because I didn't pay for the list, but a hand up and some insight to helping me form what needed to have to happen. And this was another way for me to start what I considered forming strategic alliances. Centers of influences and strategic alliances became really the basis of my, my marketing. Um, and it's something we've heard of a lot. Now we go back to that LIMRA project, you know, LIMRA project 100s. We go back to those LIMRA, you know, statistics of, you know, 11, 12, 16 people out of 100 making it four years. And this has been the help here. This has been, you know, part of the difference maker of why I believe I've succeeded. Number one, because somebody helped me out. Several people have helped me out, but it's been through trial and error. It's been through a lot of failures, as you can see it. It's been through perseverance uh, and tried and true methods. It's definitely not been because I was a quitter, right? I, I've just kept on trying. I chose not to fail or, or stay in a failure mode. I kept getting up and trying new things. I was not afraid to ask for help at this point. Uh, in an area that I really felt like was something for me. So strategic alliances is where it formed. And this is the basis for my marketing for the majority of my career. And I've been blessed to, to have developed some great strategic alliances. So we're going to take the next part of this presentation, if you will. And I want to break down strategic alliances because I want to talk about some misconceptions. I'd like to share some best practices. Uh, I, I'm going to make myself available should you have questions or concerns or need some help developing these. Again, this is my way of paying it forward, helping other people, being there for other people, just like I've had help throughout my career. So strategic alliances. So why? For those of you that are new or don't understand strategic alliances, I'm going to break this down for you. And some things that I feel are the most important for you to consider. First of all, why is it enables me and it will enable you to be laser focused on what I consider the critical components of our business. And those are revenue producing activities. You know, this business is, you know, pardon my French here, three years of hell for a lifetime of happiness. But job number one is our job is marketing. It's marketing and branding. It is nothing else in this business. Now, I say that, which we know is important for us to learn products and services and processes and things like that. But you can know everything there is to know about everything. But if you're not getting out in front of a quali enough qualified prospects on a routine, regular basis, you're going to become a limerous statistic. Or worse than a limerous statistic, you're going to absolutely hate what you do. And I'm going to share with you about you know, the success and how I feel about the work I do. But if you are focused on job number one, which is marketing, or what we call RPAs, the revenue-producing activities, 
our job as financial professionals is to either be in front of a prospect, learning more about what their concerns are, their goals, their needs, their objectives, their risk tolerance, their timeline uh, or time horizon, if you will, in order to gather the best information in data gathering, discovery or fact finding or needs analysis, whatever it is, if you're not doing that, and I would say trying to do that 12 to 15 times a week, and I know that sounds like a large number, but that's the numbers of the numbers game. If you're not doing that, then you need to be, if you're not in front of people doing that, then you need to be doing what you have to do to get in front of them. And if that means just like me and most of our team, the way we were taught of being on the phone every Monday evening between 6.30 and 8.30 or 9, right before, you know, and then the do not call list came in at nine o'clock. And then again, every Saturday morning, unless it's a holiday weekend or that once every three-year vacation you get when you're new in the business, you're filling in the blanks and you're getting that 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th appointment, but you're definitely not going into a week like a business owner, like a storefront owner with only two or three items to sell that week, which would be the, it'd be crazy. It'd be like going into the week with only two or three appointments. You know, you, what kind of a batting average you have? What kind of sales average can you have? What, what are your odds when you've already got people that are going to no show and cancel? So you've got to go in with those numbers. You're either in front of people learning more about them or closing them or providing solutions, or you're doing what it takes to get in front of them, which is prospecting and marketing. I would much rather have warm introductions that are providing me with that level of credibility than doing the cold calling that I'm talking to you about. And if you don't have a warm source like I didn't, or one that was credible enough to be calling, this is a great way for you to get started. When you have warm introductions, it's different than cold calling. I said introductions, and that is different than referrals. And you're going to learn more about that in my presentation as well. It enables me to spend more time in relationship management. Now, listen, a lot of you belong to organizations, and I'm going to talk to you about different organizations and why I choose NAFA over anything else. But I would much rather spend my time, talent, and treasure with people who spend their time, talent, and treasure with me than out there trying to find new people or spending time with organizations that don't care or that I'm drinking or buying coffees, or doing one-to-ones, or having lunches, or, or trying to get people to learn about me when all they're trying to do is sell me their product, and they don't really care, because our business is different. It requires people to have you know, honesty and humility. They share with us stuff different than if you're talking to a plumber or a mechanic. People, it's easier when you're in networking groups to talk about things like that, but nobody really wants to talk to us because we know they know we're going to ask them to be honest and to spend some of their money that they're wasting or that they're going to have to tell you, hey, if I'm being honest, I'm not as far along as I told you I was going to be, or I have more debt than I've led on to, or I make less than I maybe bragged about. So it's harder. These strategic alliances allowed you to cut through that because you're working with somebody that already knows the facts. They've already been vetted, if you will. I have already talked about credibility. When you're working with a strategic alliance, it's assumed as though that person's already vetted you and you're okay. That takes care of half the battles. That drops so many walls down to begin with because you don't have to do the dog and pony. Now, you still have to prove yourself and you're still interviewing, but it's, it's more with assumed consent and it's how can you help them versus can I get the job at all? They may not have a need, but then you could probably have permission to go forward and nurture that relationship. So if they do have a need or something changes, maybe they'll think of you on a more favorable basis. I can be more efficient with strategic alliances because... I have less places to go, less people to talk to, less relationships to manage and to develop and to take care of and nurture than all these new ones each and every week that makes my calendar look like I'm just all over the place. And when it's efficient and you have processes and you have credibility, doing it this way is going to be more profitable. And at the end of the day, just like we tell our clients with their budget analysis when we're doing financial planning or retirement strategies, it's it's the profitability that's most important. I really don't care how much you make. I really want to know how you're using it and what's left over and what you've decided to do with it. More importantly, are you paying yourself first? This allows us to become more profitable. And with the airing of this show that you're going to see in the NAFA Live, you know, gas is not real cheap. Vehicles aren't real cheap. There's a, like, there's a high cost of doing business these days. But we also, because of COVID, have been given this unbelievable opportunity to meet people wherever they are through this amazing technology. So profitability is huge here. So strategic alliances, I say why, and you need to be asking yourself why, because it just makes sense just with these five or six different bullet points. Now, 
what are some prerequisites? What are some things that we need to think about? I'm going to tell you, if you think about or deciding, Steve, I want to talk to you, or I want to start thinking about developing some strategic alliances. So I'm going to go out there and start shopping. You need to ask this of yourself first. And if you can't answer in the affirmative, you need to work on it a little bit or get some help or delegate it before you go out on this quest, because it is, it's a non-negotiable. It's a non-negotiable. And I say this with all due respect in working with teams, because I work with teams of people in which, again, since I figured it out, since Limmer says it's not about, you know, how good you look or how well you dress or how well you talk or, you know, what your company's ratings are or the products or services or pricing or all that. It's about getting in front of enough qualified prospects. If this is going to be the case, then you have to master this. And I've helped a lot of people do this because it's enabling them to grow their businesses that much better and quicker and profitable because uh, of the alliances. So you need to be organized. Organized with your time, organized with your thought, organized with everything you do with this relationship. And it is a relationship and you need to treat it like one. And just like any other relationship, depending on how you treat it, depending on how you nurture it and you care for it, is going to be dependent on the fruits of the labor. Just remember that. The time management. Um, and I say that because, you know, nothing worse that can happen is if you had a strategic alliance with a, you know, let's say you had a strategic alliance with a group health person. And they've got a client sitting in the lobby and you've got this three o'clock in the afternoon appointment and it's 3.05 and you're not there, but the client's there and your strategic alliance or the group office owner, or the agent that's, you know, their client is talking to them, making small talk because you're late. I mean, you can't perform properly if you're late. You need to be ready as if you almost appear to work there, that you're on their team in an essence, that you are an extension of their value and their, their value proposition and their tools and resources and re support. Now, with all that being said, all of this has to go through your compliance and depending on how that works is going to be dependent on how you align yourself, how you communicate that, how you, you know, how you lay it out and how you, you know, communicate it verbally and in, in writing. But you got to be early, you got to be on time and you got to be, you know, just suit up and show up. You got to be there and be in the present. You can't be distracted. You have to be accountable for everything you say that you're going to do and you do. Um, you're going to have some service, uh, but I want you to know that sometimes servicing people is part of the business and you're adding value and you're, you're making an impact. You're making a difference and that's important, but you also have to realize and think about sometimes we can turn a service obligation into a sales opportunity. So it all depends on how you look at it. And some of these terms that I'm coining or throwing out to you, I didn't make all these up. So if you're in the audience, you're going to say, hey, he got that from me or he got that from us. Thank you. It's worked and I continue to use it. Thanks for sharing. You have to be trustworthy. You know, the, and the good thing is, is that I'm, I'm practicing or I'm preaching to the choir. Part of the reason why I spend so much time with NAFA and talk about NAFA and I wear the, the, I wear the, the pin, the NAFA pin, my lapel button all the time because I'm proud to be a member is because we all align ourselves to a standard ethical conduct, you know, a standard of ethical conduct that we can be proud of. We don't have to worry about somebody taking advantage of us or doing something wrong. We always have the client's best interests at heart. We didn't have to worry about FINRA or the Department of Labor or anybody else to tell us we've always done what's in the client's best interest. So this is for a person who has very good follow-up and follow-through. Those, those, you know, post meeting notes, those Salesforce or CRM notes, more importantly, that collaboration to let your referrer, that person that owns the strategic alliance client relationship, where you are in the process. The last thing you want to do is have one of the other last things you want to do is have your strategic alliance partner be in the grocery store or in the mall and have them come up to one of the clients saying, hey, you know, uh, thanks for referring Steve to me, but I, I, I thought he was going to call me. It's been like two weeks. I haven't even heard from the guy or he, he you know, said he was going to get with us to schedule an appointment and I haven't heard back from him. It's been like three weeks. How embarrassing would that be? And you got to realize that as I'm going through this list, this is part of the reason why some of the people you're going to call on to try to, you know, make this talk or this ask or, or see if you can, you know, talk to them about the opportunity while they're going to shut you down is because they've heard it before. They've seen it. They've tried it. So you want to lead by example here. You need to be very humble. You need to remember that these are their clients and not yours. You're, you're in care of them and you want to take care of them. You need to be patient and you need to be professionally persistent. And what I mean by that is 
we all have to realize that nobody does a lot of what we do in this industry, no matter what part of the industry you're in, um, by people calling us up unless they're dying or they've got a medical condition or it's too late or they waited the last minute or they're out of options. You know, our career, our job, our avocation is one that we, we have to be outgoing and we are presenting solutions. We're out there finding people to help. They're not calling on us. And we want to continue to do that because we don't want to be lost to these robo advisors or these online services that think they can do what we do. There's no comparison, but we have to be professionally persistent. We have to help people. We have to help as many people we do. In order to do that, we have to talk to a lot. That goes back to that 12 to 15 people per week. And that's new scenes. So what do we find some of these strategic alliance opportunities? When you start thinking about finding some and developing them or interviewing some of them, whether it's with your manager's help or somebody like me helping you. Well, here's just a short list. And you notice, and I'm not going to spend time on any of the rest of them because this is a NAFA live meeting, but you'll notice that I put NAFA up top. And I did that for a reason because NAFA has been the most rewarding, the most uh, productive, the most profitable, the most genuine, and I'm the most proudest of NAFA. And since I've put more of my time in this organization, can you guess where I get the majority of my results from? And this is not me being selfish. We all know that when we go into any organization, I don't care if it's an association or organization like this, or whether it's BNI or Rotary or Kiwanis or you know, any of those chamber meetings, it's going to take some time. The benefit of NAFA is, is that we all understand each other's business and we get why we're doing it and networking. So I think we've all kind of put that secret aside of why we're in it. It's all more about now trying to find the right personality matches. So it's more of matchmaking in the strategic alliance arena. It's more of a, are you doing your part? Um, are you a valued volunteer leader? Are you making an impact? And so with NAFI, I could check all those boxes off. Now, you know, I, I could talk about the BNIs, the Chambers, the Kiwanis, the, the Rotaries, all those. And listen to me, I, I mean this with all due respect. They're all fine organizations that do all good things in their communities for people. And I respect that. And I appreciate that you remember that. But, you know, I'm literally not spending a lot of time, as I mentioned, buying people coffee and dinners and drinks, and I'm not taking them to lunches. And, and I, you know, what I have decided is I wanted to be in alignment with an organization that is in alignment with me, my moral compass, um, my, my standard ethical conduct, standard of ethical conduct. I wanted to be in alignment with what I felt like was important in my ability to serve the community. If you think about NAFA, you think about professionally developing yourself, you think about iron sharpening iron, you think about advocating on behalf of the end user of the community, that, that's our consumers. And are we making a difference in making, you know, trying to help in our positive legislative environment? We're not buying votes. You know, we're not out there, you know, buying legislators. You know, ultimately, I'm out there when I'm doing my, my NAFA, my pack and pick duties. I'm rubbing shoulders with, you know, politicians that are business owners in a lot of cases as well. I'm also, when I'm out there and I'm in a fundraising opportunity, I'm rubbing shoulders with other people who have a check in their pocket just like I do. Maybe theirs is $250 or $500, depending on the limit. They don't know necessarily that maybe mine or yours is $25 or $75 or $100. But nonetheless, I'm still rubbing shoulders with other business owners and other, other people of influence, other people in the, in the industry and in my community that, you know, are people for an opportunity to help them and align myself. So, you know, and then, and then the community service, the impact we make with the future generation, people coming into this business, communities, the, the literacy and the education that we're doing with, you know, with the consumers and, and average people out there to try to help educate them and empower them. And in many states across the country, bring that literacy into the school levels and things like that. So I do that because NAFA is more aligned with me. So I want to make sure you're aware of that. And again, those other organizations are good, but I just got to ask yourself, how's that net working? Not networking. How's that net working? It, with a question mark, how's it working for you? I mean, are you putting dollars and cents to it? Is the squeeze, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze? Are you diluting yourself by being a member of too many organizations? And I'm a member of several of these, and so are many of you. But NAFA is something I do. I, I, I you know, I, I am NAFA. I don't do Dave, NAFA, excuse me. So, you know, some of the alliance partners that I'm going to go to, and 
I go back to the NAFA is, do you know how many CPA members we have in NAFA? I think you'd be shocked if you found that out. Well, many of them not only work with personal clients, but they work with corporations. So depending on your specialty, uh, and then you have PNC clients, those that have individual or commercial property and casualty clients, other NAFA members um, in CE classes, um, small business you know, and commercial lenders, group health people that are in our industry, uh, community banks that are in our industry, uh, attorneys that are in our industry, there's different trust officers, and there's different things that I put down here as my way in or what I might be able to provide or way that, ways that I'll get to know them. But at the end of the day, it's exposure. And every one of these areas offer me potential and very rewarding high level and profitable strategic alliance opportunities. So, um, and I would just ask you here, you know, I want you to ask yourself, um, how many of you specialize in all the areas that we're able to do in our industry? And the truth is, if you're being honest with yourself, we can do all these things, but what do you really specialize in? What are you really good at? What do you do the most of? And, you know, when I, when I look at some of these, I mean, I could look at a property and casualty office and on their glass storefront or on their website, it says they do this, this, and this. But if I really press them and somebody called them to buy something, they're probably going to get a NIGO and not in good order because it's been so long since they've done it. The truth is that they, they specialize in property and casualty and probably one area more than others. So there's a real opportunity for us to align ourselves with each other to be better as a team. And then you can start talking about your team. So, but in order for all this to happen, as you think about going out and shopping and then having interviews and trying to form strategic alliances, you must be able to answer one simple question. When you're asking yourself, how do I develop the strategic alliance? You have to be able to answer one simple question. And I'm going to tell you right now, it is not. So before I give you the, the secret sauce, it is not, as you see in this picture, how can I add more stress to the staff? Because you got to remember, sometimes the staff is going to be thinking, and they're your backbone, I promise you, great, here's another good, great idea, the next great idea that's going to cause more work for us that we're not going to get paid for. It's additional work. Or this, this guy or girl is going to come in and it's going to create a mess. And this is, you know, some of the offices you walk in look like this, you probably want to run. That's just an indication. Um, oh, they're going to create more additional customer service for us. They're going to create complaints for us. Um, or they're going to come in and try to take over our staff. And I've seen this happen. Everything I'm telling you, I promise that I've seen this happen and it has caused failure or caused me to remove a member off of a strategic alliance or caused me to lose an alliance because of this. So this is not what you want to happen. Remember, we talked about those attributes that you need to remember. It's not these. And knowing the answers is important. And what are the answers? You have to be able to answer for the person you're interviewing for Strategic Alliance, W-I-I-F-M. And for those of you that don't know, it's what's in it for me. We have to be able to answer what's in it for them. And I can say that, in, and it's, this, it's the same thing as our, our sales cycle in our business or your business, whatever specialty you, it, you have, is that you have to overcome the objection before it becomes one. And so when I say, you know, and when you're thinking about maybe this slide being your first slide is, you know, are you looking for a way to create some peace of mind for you and your staff and your clients? Are you looking for an additional revenue stream? And if it's a CPA or an attorney, are you looking for additional billable hours? You need to talk their jargon. They, they talk in billable hours. Are you looking to be able to have full service offering? And for lack of a better term, kind of one-stop shop without actually having to be licensed or specializing in it or actually being involved in it at all. I mean, you could be as involved or uninvolved as you want. Are you looking to reduce potential litigation? Back to my example of that person with the, the front glass on the storefront property and casualty, when it says, you know, we do retirement planning or investments or life insurance, when they don't know how to perform or they have not in good order NIGOs, you know, or when they're, when they're trying to just fill an order, and this is no... I'm not picking on PNC. We need to all think about what we're doing haphazardly. And this is the risk. It's potential litigation. It's going to happen sooner or later. If you don't understand it, if you're not perfecting it, if you're not developing it, if you're not you know, enhancing your knowledge, if you're not specializing in it, you're winging it. And so I'll tell you to be careful. Are you looking to add value to your clients by offering them complimentary services? And this is where you can differentiate yourself by offering them things that don't cost them anything. Would you look for, would you be interested in looking for ways that you can create sticky business or an additional second or third line of business, which we all know increases our retention in this business? 
do you have any interest in developing your staff uh, in their knowledge and their experience and their abilities, their, their, their competency levels? And then are you taking new clients? I mean, and this is, sounds like a stupid question, but if you're talking to somebody that's later in their life and they haven't even created a succession plan, they don't even have an, a, a catastrophe plan, they're probably not interested in taking on new clients. Or, you know, if you were talking to somebody that had the picture of the office that looks like this, uh, what would they do if they got new clients, right? So you want to be very, very careful when you come about that. Our ideal strategic alliance partner also has to have some attributes to wind this down. You know, they have to be able to allow and be willing for you to mine their client base. They have to be able to make favorable introductions. Now, this is not going to be all three, four, five hundred other clients. It's going to be more strategic. Maybe they're A clients, maybe the ones that they feel have a fit for something you're looking to fill. Um, they need to be able to assist with, you know, with your marketing, with joint field work, with consumer education workshops. Um, they need to be open to different marketing approaches. Now, when I say open, it means open to hearing about them. At the end of the day, they've got to be comfortable and they have to take ownership to what they decide on for it to work. It can't be your idea or you're going to be pushing uphill. And then again, they need to be attending or supporting and uh, being a good advocate and promoting any of the training that they decide would be important to their team members in order for this to be a success. So this is, this is really good. So I've mentioned a lot here for you to consider, and I'd be willing to talk to you offline if you had any more questions. But when you talk about breaks, and you know, my big break, my big break, if you haven't noticed it now, has been my NAFO relationships. I've mentioned earlier, and I tell people all the time, and people ask me all the time, I don't know where, because they follow my social media, where you get the time to do all you do. When you are laser focused on revenue producing activities, and when you're working strategic alliances, and when my number one source is NAFA relationships, that allows me to serve better. It allows me to share my time, talent, and treasure with the people who respect it, who warrant it, who want it, and who reciprocate it. So my no number one NAFA relationships is definitely NAFA. So when I say I don't, you know, I don't do NAFA, I am NAFA, it's because it becomes a part of who I am. It's not something I time slot. It's not something that's a to-do list. It's not something that's a second thought. It is as naturally a part of me and my business plan and my family and my path and my thought and my heart is anything else. And for those of you that know me, you know that's the truth. These are just a few examples of some of the strategic alliances that I've been able to form through my association with NAFA. And it's important for me to tell you that in my volunteer leader responsibilities and duties over the years, my exposure has created these opportunities for conversations. I wasn't necessarily out looking for them. And when I'm doing NAFA business, that's not my goal or my focus. It's NAFA business. But when people see how you act and how you look, not the picture from my elementary school, how you dress, how you carry yourself, how you follow through and follow up, how you care when they're around you enough, when they serve side by side with you, like my military days, NAFA is similar and that we become a family and you start to earn trust and credibility and it's easier for people to do business with you or ask. So these are just some examples of some areas around the state of Florida and some different industries and specialties that I've been able to form and still have today after many, many years, many of them uh, many of them, the majority of these over 20 years standing develop, you know, relationships that I now have staff and some of my associates and some of my junior partners involved in to work more the day to day, but I'm still actively involved in the relationship management. I typically get called in for the A clients or the bigger or more complex cases, and I manage and hold accountable and communicate the relationship where it's going all the time with all of these. Um, but just whether it's me making a pre-licensing school you know, why be a member of NAFA presentation, which formed a CPA relationship, which I actually have purchased um, about two weeks ago, the business for the gentleman retiring, the, the financial advising side of his business. And now he's going to be uh, retiring the CPA side uh, here shortly, all the way through wealth management, providing what risk management, PNC, group health, property and casualty, group benefits, and another CPA and wealth management firm. Those are just the five or six of the strongest ones that I have. So some of the things that I would like to, to end on that are very important as I bring and thread this story together is, you know, it definitely has paid to be a NAFA member. It pay, has paid me, as you've seen, uh, just not in my family, 
Um, my son chose to come into business and he's succeeding my practice after, after going to NAFA conferences and NAFA Florida conferences, after meeting my family, my NAFA family and collaborating. Uh, it wasn't because of a certain carrier or company affiliation, even though I'm very proud of those and talk about them. It's been because my son and my family have been, you know, part of the NAFA family. And uh, I really believe that we're, we're all better together. So <clears throat> some things that I want to share with you as I end and, and land the plane here. Uh, and now I'm actually landing on the planes. I'm not jumping out of perfectly good an airplanes anymore is that, you know, I am supposed to be here. I made it. I beat the odds. But as you can see, it's been through sheer, you know, uh, perseverance. I, I have tried hard. Um, I am a very hard worker and very disciplined. Um, I've taken the advice that's been given to me. Um, I've learned from people. I've been open minded. I have I have learned from my mistakes. And then most importantly, I took what was given to me. I took the the promise that I made to others and I've tried to pay it forward. I've tried to lead by example. I've tried to show that I was a good steward of the information and knowledge that was given to me, the help that was provided to me over the years through NAFA and my NAFA relationships. Um, as you saw some of the pictures before I talked about alcohol, some of the other rewards that I would share with you is, is that I'm grateful to have been sober now for over a decade. October will be 14 years. Um, just in the past six months, I've had multiple people at least three that I can share with you, which I won't share the names, obviously, because of anonymity, that have come up to me and said, Steve, I've noticed that you've talked about drinking and sobriety and how much better your comprehension and your life and your family and your business is because you, you no longer drink alcohol and you're very open about talking about your recovery. And I am. And because I am, and it's because it's part of me being vulnerable and being willing to tell my story, that those three people felt comfortable enough to, to contact me outside of the meeting that they heard me share that and ask for help themselves. Many of them were collaborating on today. Many of them were touching base and talking about recovery. Many of them have you know, decided to join me in different areas and organizations of further service and sobriety. And many of them just said, you know, thank you. Um, but my, my level of success and the promotion that, that Brendan and the marketing team did you know, makes it seem like I'm all that and some. Here's just a very short list of some of my qualifications. But it, if you've noticed, I've not mentioned money very much or fame or fortune or prestige. My success has revolved around my serenity, my blessings, the pure joy and satisfaction I have of getting up every morning still almost 32 years later and making an impact, trying to help somebody however I possibly can, paying it forward and giving it back. Uh, being able to be of maximum service to my community, my industry, um, and you've seen that through my volunteer leadership and service for these years. Um, my success has been about, you know, being, being able to have the, the freedom that I have right now to be able to travel for NAFA and not always send them a bill. Being able to invest my treasure for NAFA and its, and its mission. Uh, being able to help support and collaborate with other people. You know, and there was a lot of people that helped me along the way. Um, you're, you know, there's people on the leadership team I won't call out, people that are very high up on the leadership team, people that are very, very close to leading our organization um, that helped me. You know, when I, when I wasn't making as much money, when I didn't really know which direction to go, there was a lot of people that helped me. People that would offer to help me, you know, by riding with them in a carpool to Day on the Hill or to a national or state meeting. People that shared a hotel room with me with a double bed. Uh, and there's a lot of stories that go into that. Um, people there that were there, uh, when I maybe, when my behavior got to the point where it was close to being an embarrassment to myself and my family and the organization at hand, uh, took me aside and gave me direction and gave me counsel. People that gave me, um, part of their, you know, higher calling and their stability and serenity um, when, I, when I didn't have it. So I owe a great deal. So when you ask me, you know, why am I here? It's because I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to take what I learned and pass that forward. I'm incredibly grateful for those people and the opportunity to give back what's been so freely given to me. So I'd like to take a minute and say thank you for your time. Thank you for enduring this 45 minutes or so of my presentation. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be vulnerable and honest and for taking you on this journey of my trip 
being a little bit maybe more vulnerable and personal than you anticipated. Hopefully you stayed on. Hopefully you found something you can relate to. And hopefully um, you got a little something out of this that's going to make a difference in your life or you're somebody that has the ability and the blessing to make a difference in somebody else's life. So with that being said, thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been an honor.